But let me just start by saying on behalf of all of us at Delaware North that has a privilege of operating the Kennedy Space Center Visitor Complex, I would like to formally welcome you to today's special astronaut encounter celebrating the 40th anniversary of Apollo 13. Thanks, Bill. Hey, it's a real privilege for me to be here today to welcome all of you to the uh, Kennedy Space Center. And uh, we do have a treat in store for you. As a young boy growing up in Minnesota, I never dreamed I'd be an astronaut one day. I just wanted to fly airplanes. And uh, as a young midshipman at the Naval Academy, I had the privilege of coming down here to see Apollo 13 launch. And uh, that was really special. Um, you know, Apollo 13 was probably NASA at its finest. And although the astronauts are a very visible part of the crew, they're just a small part of a tremendously capable, talented, exceptional team. And it was that team that got them into space and brought them home safely. And talk a little bit about Apollo 13 and uh, also your careers overall. Your mission started out relatively routinely with that 20 minute long drive uh, out to the, uh, to the launch pad. Tell us, what was the atmosphere like on board the uh, transfer van? Uh, was there a lot of talk or uh, were you kind of quiet getting your heads in the game? How did that, how did that work? Well, uh, we're all suited up in our spacesuits, uh, we had been breathing uh, pure oxygen to purge our bodies of nitrogen because in those days the, uh, the spacecraft flew at a low pressure. So we didn't want to get the bends when we went into space. And consequently, we really didn't see anything. I mean, we were just all in our own individual thoughts. And uh, so they were really, uh, you know, what, with, without a, with the helmet on, you really couldn't uh, whole conversation. So as Jim said, they were just thinking about here we here it is, the, finally the big day, and uh, it's been a long time uh, working. Uh, we had gone through uh, a couple of crew cycles before as a backup on Apollo 11, so here we're going to finally get our chance. Well, Graham, I was recycled actually to Apollo 11. I was uh, going to be the command module pilot on Apollo 11 with uh, Neil Armstrong and, uh, uh, and, uh, and Buzz Aldrin. But, uh, uh, Mike, Mike Collins in Apollo 8 had a problem that he had to have fixed uh, medically, and so I replaced him on Apollo 8. Uh, and those of you who are old enough to remember, it was the Christmas flight of 1968. Uh, this was really the high point of my space career. Uh, we were the first people to uh, lead the way all the way to the moon, the first people to see the far side of the moon. We don't know that. We do not see the far side from the Earth. Always keeps the far side away from us. Uh, first time to really see the Earth as it really is. A very small body uh, around a normal star where you can put your thumb up and can really hide the Earth behind your thumb. Uh, uh, similar to Jim uh, said about one of his missions, uh, Apollo 8 being the, the height uh, Flying Enterprise was, I call it, the peak of my uh, professional uh, career. Uh, it's kind of unusual to get to do a womb to tomb uh, thing with a, uh, an aircraft. And obviously not me alone, but a large team again. But to be a part of the vehicle, in a way, I wasn't in Apollo. I arrived uh, in midstream, was involved in a lot of the testing, but had, didn't, had nothing to do with the conceptual design, whereas I can look at the shuttle and the configuration of the windows, uh, a lot of the panel layout inside, instrument panel, uh, even the CRT type, uh, the layouts on the scopes. Uh, I was at the beginning of uh, involvement of a lot of that sort of stuff, so I could see more of, of what I uh, participated in in shuttle than I could in, in Apollo in that sense. The capsule uh, in most spacecraft had chilled down and when we powered down over uh, most of that four days, uh, in somewhere in the 30s. In fact, the uh, command module, even when they retrieved it uh, and got it on the hangar deck on the Iwo Jima aircraft carrier, they found the water tank still frozen in that uh, mothership. So uh, with, a, with the divers, uh, the Navy SEALs uh, got in the water and saved the capsule and opened the hatch. And, and we don't open the hatch. Uh, they, when they've done their thing, they got a special tool 
and they knock on the window and tell us they're ready, and then they open the hatch that uh, just a cloud of frosty air poured out of this capsule uh, into the uh, nice, uh, warm uh, South Pacific uh, by the Samoan Islands where we get the uh, stars down.